Okay, I think it's recording because it's there's a little light thing that's flashing. Does it mm -hmm. say it's recording at your end? Yes, I it think it's like is. it. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so we're going to listen to a bit of this debate. So, for some background, I guess. Um, Cam, you sent me this, I think we were chatting about something once and you said, oh, have you seen this debate? And you sent it to me. And then I sat and listened to it one, uh, at some point. And when I listened to, so it's a debate between um, Greg Caven, I think is how you say the surname, and who's an atheist guy and um, a Christian guy called Callum Miller who's been on, I think he was one of the two people that was on that Capturing Christianity podcast episode where it was two scholars debate the resurrection of something, of genuine evidence for <laughs> resurrection from two scholars. Um, and then it turned out that neither of them actually had any professional qualifications in history. So I figured, I know two guys who haven't got professional qualifications in history either, and we could talk about what he's talking about, because it turns out you don't actually need to be... Um, qualified like that to do that type of thing so um so we're gonna just play a bit we're just gonna run through most of his opening speech and just sort of pause when he says stuff that prompts comment or whatever um <clears throat> i'm skipping a bit the very first bit of what he says because it's basically just a sort of fairy tale narrative version of like he's just sort of saying the story of Jesus's life in like a three minute summary um and there's no argument it's not really apologetics it's, it's kind of pointless and it's as if he's just setting the scene or something I guess maybe it's motivational pump or something but it, yeah so we're skipping that we're just going into the bit where more or less I mean I haven't I'm so professional I haven't even worked out exactly where <laughs> that bit stops and the bit we want to talk about starts. But somewhere around the point where I press play, he's going to start changing tack from doing the narrative to doing the kind of defense or whatever. Um, so if it gets to the point where you want to say something, just say, I'm going to stop or raise your hand or something, and I'll press pause. Um, yeah, does that seem good? Sounds good. OK. Cool. Well, let's see. Let's see what uh, Callum Miller is chatting about in this bit. Hebrew law regarded the crucified as accursed by God, and so the movement was dead. The wannabe king died as he was born, a lonely, rejected loser. This is from the Nazareth. end of the narrative bit, still. But a few days later, those who followed him and abandoned him began to preach that he was alive and that he was king. Those who rejected him all along began yeah, to yeah, say the same thing. Right. This crosses so that a few decades later, bishops in Syria were writing. Come, fire and cross, come yeah, yeah, acceptance, yeah. and from any other uh, secret addiction to money, sex, or whatever else we long for and beat ourselves. So remarkably, a very strong case can be made even yeah, without yeah. looking at Christian documents to begin with. Using only non-Christian documents from the first century after Jesus. I'm talking about people here like the Jewish historian Josephus, Roman historians uh, Tacitus and Suetonius, um, Roman writer and governor Pliny the Younger. These are all non-Christian sources writing within the first century after Jesus. And from these people, we learn the following. That Christians were widely persecuted across the Mediterranean from a very early age. That Jesus' own brother, James, was executed by Jewish authorities in AD 62. That Jesus himself was crucified under Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. That the movement stopped briefly before resuming on the third day, is the language Josephus uses. In Judea, before spreading to Rome. That Christians met on a fixed day, as Pliny writes. Uh, that Jesus was called the Messiah, the Christ, that he was called and known as a wise man and a miracle worker, and that Christians even prayed to him as a God, that Christians had a stringent... So wait, I want to pause here just to see, what do you think about the stuff he's just said so far? Are these facts that everyone agrees we know from non-biblical historical sources? Sure. Um, you can see that he's got no uh, qualification because he mispronounces ancient names, but so far so good. Yeah, I mean, there is just a couple of minor points, but uh, it's all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, I mean, I think he's, what's going on is this kind of apologetical move of saying, I don't have to base this all in the Bible. 
Like yeah, but re remember very carefully that or very well that he wants to make this argument primarily from uh, non-Christian sources. Yeah, because when it comes to him at the very end assigning like a numerical value to how much various pieces of evidence point towards uh, the resurrection hypothesis, he's going to assign a conversion of James like 1000 uh, to one in favor of the resurrection, which of course the James starting as someone who thought Jesus is crazy is only recorded in the gospel of Mark. It's not mm -hmm. even recorded in other gospels and it's actually significant that later gospels drop that piece of information. Um, but yeah, I mean, so far so good. Okay, cool. And Cam, do you have anything else you wanted to jump in with here or should we keep going? No, I think it's okay to keep going. Okay, cool. Moral code and that they spread widely in large numbers very shortly after Jesus' death. And so it's important not to underestimate the force of this evidence. Many of these facts are attested multiple times across these non-Christian authors and are beyond historical doubt. I mean, one thing here, it, I don't know what the phrase beyond historical doubt means. I mean, is that different to beyond doubt? I mean, what's the difference? Um, is there a standard? I mean, wasn't the standard in ancient history kind of different to modern history? Is, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm confused. I'm genuinely confused. What, beyond historical doubt means. Um, yeah, I take it to mean something like beyond doubt uh, from the perspective of a historian, um, which I would reject. I think that commonly in apologetics and defenses of the resurrection, a type of certainty is presented that just isn't justified um, based on the methods of history. In mm -hmm. fact, I think that in history, uh, even some of our most secure claims are still ones that are worthy of questioning. Um, but maybe he means something uh, a lot softer than beyond doubt. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, I mean, I wanna say stuff like, you know, World War II definitely happened. I mean, if that's what it means to be beyond historical doubt, then, you know, fine, fair enough, I get that sort of thing seems right, but then, I do kind of wonder if anything about the ancient world in anything like specific about the ancient world is like completely beyond historical doubt if that's the standard. You know? mm. And part of the difficulty is that some of the, I mean, I said that we could move on <laughs> earlier, <laughs> but some of the things that he mentioned, they aren't, um, uh, they aren't, claims that are widely attested like we might have one outside source that attests to it or two but there is a case to be made that the belief of those external commenters on christianity uh, that that belief would be derived by what christians were saying at the time that they were writing so it's not necessarily clear that these writers had information um, and they certainly don't demonstrate that they have information that is independent of what claims Christians were making at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that does allow for, um, for the possibility that they were mistaken and they were merely basing their judgment or their comments on what it was Christians preached in the second century or late first century. Yeah, like... I, think, I think there are much juicier bits later on, so... <laughs> okay, yeah, let's keep going, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, there are a number of other facts we can establish without the resources of Christian writers and biographers. It is virtually certain that any given Jewish cr um, criminal in Palestine in the reign of Pilate would be buried in a known place. I have laid out... Okay, this bit, he goes into some, spends a few minutes on this one point that... Um, and I think this is all over the place, right? So just as a, a, a kind of cue here, I think this is, this is nuts, but I, I wanna see what you guys think. So let's, let's, uh, let's let him make his case and then we'll come back to it in a second. Some of this evidence for this elsewhere, and I'll just summarize it now. There's a divine command throughout the Old Testament to bury the dead, both for the dead's sake and for the land's sake. Since anyone hung from a tree is cursed according to Deuteronomy, there's an extra reason not to leave someone who was crucified out without being buried. God commands explicitly that anyone executed must be buried 
properly in order to avoid defiling the land. So this wasn't just something that was for the sake of the dead person. This was something for the land. And so it doesn't matter that Jesus would have been a criminal. Uh, what matters is that the land was holy to the Jewish culture. And so there would be an absolute obligation to bury them. This command is reiterated throughout the Old Testament and afterwards, both in apocryphal literature and in the Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran. In addition, first century writers Philo and Josephus repeat these same sentiments. And in later rabbinical writings in Midrash, um, in the Talmud uh, and other Jewish writings after the time of Jesus, the need for burial is re-emphasized again and again, and it's even commanded to high priests. This non-Christian historical evidence is clear about burial protocol. Bones from the corpse um, were collected a year later and put in an ossuary. In the case of criminals, ossuaries would be transferred to the family tomb. Public mourning for, for criminals sorry, was prohibited, so praying inside tombs was often necessary, and excavations have confirmed this. Spices and perfume were typically taken to the tomb, and respected holy men would usually have their tombs venerated. And finally, we know from non-Christian literature, from Jewish writings, that the Sanhedrin, the High Council in Jerusalem, was given a specific duty to provide a tomb for executed criminals. All right, so I think that's enough for the, more or less, it's clear what he's saying here, right? It seems to be yeah, what so he's saying. Yeah, you go. Yeah, I, so assuming everything that he said is true, are you convinced that Jesus was buried in an empty tomb by Joseph of Arimathea, which was later discovered empty by his female disciples? Uh, no, I'm not. No. Why, why is it the case? Well, it seems to me that what he's, <laughs> apart from the fact that he doesn't mention anything about the specifics of like Joseph of Arimathea and there being an empty tomb and there being people come and find him, um, what he talks about is Jewish burial traditions but it seems to me that while well, that would be relevant if it was clear that Jesus was buried by Jewish people whereas it seems to me plausible and I don't know either way here that the people who were crucified were taken down by Romans that it would have been the Romans who basically decided whether to give this corpse back to the, the Jewish authorities to deal with as they wanted to or to just I don't know, do what they want, chuck it in a ditch or burn it or let the wolves eat it or whatever the hell the Romans wanted. So it seems to me that it only makes sense to sort of talk about what the Sanhedrin declared or whatever, like Jewish burial practices, if you knew that Jewish people buried Jesus's body. But I, I don't personally know how many crucified people the Romans handed back over to the Jewish authorities for them to sort out or whether they just... I mean, the Romans were kind of dick-like, weren't they? So I don't kind of picture your standard little asshole Roman being like, no, fuck you, I'm just going to throw this guy in a ditch, being all colonial and authoritarian or whatever. Um, that, that seems to me that, I don't know, right? But off the top of my head, that at least feels plausible that, that that could have happened all the time. And he doesn't say anything about that. It's almost like the fact that that didn't happen or anything like that is just assumed without any argument. And all you have to do is establish what the Jewish burial practice was, right? That's, that's, oh. that's why it seems to me it's kind of off the Well, you know, Jesus is depicted as being buried by the Jews in the gospel, so <laughs> come on. <laughs> got, can go for it. Uh... Yeah, so I think there needs to be um, some clarity on which thing he's exactly claiming here. So is he saying that on the basis of background knowledge about Jewish burial practices or burial practices in the region at the time, uh, this uh, Jesus's burial is virtually certain? Or is he saying that based upon the content in the gospels, and that it's virtually certain. Like, it's not clear to me because at certain points here, I think he's relying on, for example, when he mentions like a circular sealing stone and a custodian guarding tomb and Sanhedrin member and all this type of stuff. This appears to be coming from the Gospels. But the case started off with him mentioning things from our background knowledge. Um, the claim to virtually certain, oh, I find that very difficult to believe. Like Alex mentions, it seems there are many different possibilities where some norm could be violated in, in a uh, circumstance relating to a criminal or, um, you know, simply in virtue of the Romans disposing of the body. Um, 
And there are uh, many contemporary historians that do think that this is quite plausible. So if you find yourself judging uh, the body being disposed by somebody other than Jesus's followers or Joseph of Arimathea, um, then it's pretty hard to say you're virtually certain that, <laughs> um, yeah, it just seems to be ruling out the possibility. Yeah, it seems, I think that to be virtually certain about it, you'd have to be virtually certain that Roman authorities always handed over the corpses of crucified people to whatever authority it was that they belonged to when they were alive. And though that you had to be certain that there was never any exceptions to that, it seems to me. Whereas, I mean, I just don't know what the evidence is about that. And if you don't know what that frequency is, let's say they did it 50% of the time, well, there goes 50% of your certainty, because he could have been in that pile of corpses over there that never got buried. Um, and if it was 50-50, you know, who knows? Well, if we don't know what that probability is, then the whole thing's inscrutable, right? It's just who knows. Mm. Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead. There you go. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's start granting things for the sake of argument. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's it's definitely true that, like, a lot of these arguments not only rely on Jesus, Jews being the ones that were um, in charge of burying Jesus, but uh, they are mostly arguments, in like, against uh, Jesus being left on the cross to decompose. And then they don't differentiate between, like, various ways how he could have been buried, right? Because you have to... Um, mm -hmm for your argument to work, you have to ideally want to get him to be buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a rock cut tomb that can then be discovered empty, that could be an own location, so you can then demand that like a competing explanation accounts for what happened with the body, why is it the case that nobody was able to produce the body in order to refute the claim of the resurrection mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, there is just one piece of evidence that he offers specifically for the burial by a Sanhedrin council member, and that's him saying that, yeah, it was um, in the job description of the Sanhedrin council to make sure that cru crucified criminals were buried. So what he's essentially saying is that the Gospels depicting a Sanhedrin member doing something that he would be doing normally counts as evidence for the story being historical. But I think there is actually one piece of evidence that he's omitting that is evidence like against the historicity of the empty tomb narrative as we find it in the Gospels. And that's the fact that the entire Passion narrative uh, lines up extremely well with the suffering servant narrative in Isaiah in the Old Testament, and that includes details of Jesus' burial, right? So specifically Isaiah 53 verse 9 says, and they made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. And what do you know in the Gospels? Jesus is crucified between two wicked criminals, mm -hmm. and then he's buried in a rich man's grave in a very expensive tomb. And you have to explain why is it the case that the two narratives are so well interconnected. And I think there are basically three explanations. Either it's a coincidence, it's a product of like a divine design. So, you know, the suffering servant narrative is actually correctly predicting what Jesus is going to do hundreds of years in the future. Or the third explanation is that it's a product of human design. So the passion narrative is actually based on Isaiah, right? And I think this is the most probable explanation. That is the explanation that historians usually go for in similar situations in ancient literature, which I can give you some examples if you want to. And of course, Christian is going to say that the divine design hypothesis is more probable if we like have some background knowledge, for example, if we think that it's plausible for Isaiah to be predicting Jesus' death because Jesus was actually sent by God to be killed for our sins and stuff like that. But if that's the case, I would love to see how those uh, pieces of information got into the background knowledge in the first place without begging the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this goes back to what I was pointing out earlier about whether or not you're including gospel contents as um, evidence in an uh, in a claim that Jesus was buried in a tomb. Because if you are attempting to do that, what it opens you up to is a class of hypotheses that explain the same data that appears in the gospels, that is like what is written or what they say. Um, 
on hypotheses other than you know him being buried so like Camille points out um, it's a common uh, place occurrence for both uh, ancient historians sorry uh, current historians of ancient history um, as well as New Testament historians to explain contents in their literature um, by uh, reference to uh, like imitation and mimesis. And as an example of that, uh, we find in the Gospel of Mark, our earliest gospel, the author appearing to use direct quotation of the Old Testament and putting it on Jesus's lips, as well as other narrative features. So um, in the Psalms, we find, uh, is it Psalm 22? Camille? Um, yeah, it's very we, too. It's with we, the Peter Singo fans and stuff like that. Yeah, Yeah. so we find um, the opening line of the psalm is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what we find on Jesus's lips at the end, uh, you know, when he's about to die in the crucifixion is the claim of, or, you know, the statement of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and there are other narrative features like the dividing of garments and the piercing of hands that also show up too. And so it's a common um, sort of explanation of some of this content that the author is using Old Testament literature to sort of, you know, develop a narrative. And in much the same manner, Camille is suggesting that Isaiah 53 is, use, is being used to derive narrative details about the burial, in which case we are left in a position to imagine that the author probably didn't have any kind of reliable information about burial. Otherwise, it's sort of, it does seem a bit surprising why he's using this method. So what you're saying is that the details of the story and specifically the burial details um, are, are, um, what is it, are, are they illusions or they're being, they're being provided by stories in the Old Testament. So they're inspired by stuff that happened yeah, before and it's like, a kind of poetic or a narrative device or something that someone yeah, writing like, a creative well, story would use. One possible way how that could have happened is just like, you know, early Christians were Second Temple Jews, so they believe that the Old Testament is like foreshadowing what the Messiah is going to do mm -hmm. when he f actually arrives, right? And they also believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So they concluded that whatever the Old Testament has to say, Jesus must have already done when he was on earth, right? Um, so when they were coming up with the passion narrative, right? Either, uh, either whether, you know, it's original to the author of the Gospel of Mark or whether there was like a prior, prior written or oral source, that would be just a combination of their existing beliefs. So like a, a belief in a bodily resurrection where the body disappears and what their sources said. So like from oral sources, they would know that Jesus was buried. Uh, from the Old Testament, they would have Isaiah as a source, like the, the suffering servant source. So when they were like, thinking about uh, how to tell the story. Like one question they had to ask themselves is, okay, if Jesus was from like a very small, insignificant rural village and he died as a criminal and he was abandoned by his family and followers, how did he end up buried in a rich man's grave? I know there was this guy that we know of, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a Sanhedrin member, council member, so he must have been very wealthy. And he, we know from oral tradition that he was a secret disciple of Jesus. So it must have been him who um, requested Jesus' body and buried him in a very expensive tomb. So that's how the story developed. For example, that's one like possible explanation. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we know for certain historical certainty yeah, where, like, that that did happen. But the, that the, the, the point of this is that like, if, you take this, if you take this New Testament, Old Testament connection as a piece of evidence, mm -hmm. then I think that piece of evidence is actually pointing massively uh, against the hypothesis that the burial narrative as presented in the gospel is historical because either you would have to think that it's a, like an amazing coincidence it's lined up so well yeah. or you would have to think it's actually like a, a prophecy from god right um which means like absent that evidence the absent that narrative being actually in evidence 
I think you should pretty much go with what's plausible, uh, which, which we, what we can plausibly say about like burials of criminal, crucified criminals. Uh, and I think like experts in that area think that what would be the most plausible would be that like crucified uh, criminals would be buried in like a trench grave, which just means you dig up a hole, sh the shape of a human body, you dump the body in the hole, you cover it up, that completely takes care of all the uh, ritual requirements about burial of bodies and that's it mm -hmm. and then like if the claim about the resurrection takes uh, you know months or years to develop how plausible it is that after that much time someone would be able to tell which pile of dirt exactly was jesus jesus's yeah. body put like under right Mm. Yeah. So I want to attempt to explain the structure of the logic here. So I take it to be the case that if you're arguing that some particular content in the Gospels is evidence for a claim, for example, that Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb, then it must be the case that the particular content that you're relying on is explained by the hypothesis. That is, you know, if this historical thing occurred, Jesus being buried in a rich man's tomb, then it would be the case that the author would write such a thing. So that's one part of it. But it also needs to be the case that if you want to count it as evidence for that hypothesis, it isn't explained by uh, additional or d different hypotheses. And so what's being suggested here is that in the Gospels, there are a range of uh, literary hypotheses or mm. you know, other historical explanations that account for the same content that's being attempted to be claimed as data in evidence for the empty tomb or for the burial by Joseph of Arimathea. And when you find yourself in a position where the content is equally explained by competing hypotheses, you really just revert to um, an analysis of priors. So you're really interested in, you know, which explanation is more likely to be true before looking at the evidence. Yeah. Right, and right, right. um and so the assertion of camille here is that um for a number of reasons uh there is good uh reason to think that the burial by a rich man is not more probable than other outcomes that you know contradict the narrative and um for to give a little bit more support for the plausibility of these literary hypotheses it's a uh, i would say close to a consensus position that the author at least among um non I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but non-evangelical scholars, <laughs> I mean, maybe that's a bit mean to say, but like, I would say there's a majority or a consensus of experts on the Gospel of Matthew, that the author is using a kind of prophecy fulfilled device in order to construct narrative. Mm -hmm. And so an example of that in the Gospel of Matthew is this sort of, uh, out of Egypt, I call my son. And, you know, we then get a narrative about Jesus Flee, uh, fleeing to Egypt or his parents fleeing to Egypt. Um, and so there is good background plausibility for the construction of narrative from the Old Testament. And so this can't be ruled out as a competing explanation for the gospel contents. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, I'm conscious we're only like two minutes into this, <laughs> it's a half an hour video and we've got plenty to say. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna press play, we'll, we'll crack on. And so even maybe, if there were- We can maybe just let it play past when he's talking about a tomb because I'm not sure how much more meat is that on the bo that bone. Mm -hmm. No reasons to remember where Jesus was buried. It's likely that those who buried him just a day and a half earlier would remember where he was buried since the Sanhedrin themselves had the obligation to find the tomb and prepare the tomb and so on. But given the extra knowledge I've given about Jewish burial practice, all the reasons Jews would have for noting the specific location of a tomb, and especially one in the case of Jesus, it is inconceivable that Jesus' followers would not clearly note the location of his tomb when buried. And so I conclude from non-Christian historical documents alone that it is virtually certain that Jesus would have been buried in a known tomb. 
and I'm happy to supplement that case with even more extremely strong textual and archaeological evidence if this is challenged. So what else do we know from Christian history, from non-Christian history? We know that the idea of a dying Messiah was profoundly alien to Jewish thought. A dead Messiah meant a false Messiah. A crucified man meant a cursed man, not a Messiah and certainly not a God. Moreover, there was no change in the relationship between Israel and Rome. Israel were just as oppressed as ever under an increasingly belligerent Roman rule. Nothing suggested that Jesus had been a successful Messiah. Everything suggested otherwise. In addition, there was absolutely no expectation of any resurrection before the end of the world. Greco-Romans did not believe in resurrection. Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. Pharisees believed in resurrection, but only at the end of the world and never beforehand. This idea was completely alien. Other Jews probably had a mix of responses. Yes, come on. Cool. So, uh, okay, so we cleared the empty tomb pretty quickly. That's nice. And now we are getting to the idea that... Uh, you know, a dying Messiah. It's, it's very implausible that uh, early Christians would come up with the idea that Jesus was raised and that he was a, a Messiah who was killed. Uh, so Peter in Acts uh, 3.18 says, uh, in this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. So I would ask Callum if he thinks that a dying Messiah is being foreshadowed or prophesied in the Old Testament. Because if he says no, then it seems to me is contradicting Peter. But if he says yes, then he's actually in a really weird position where he simultaneously believes that the Old Testament has been or had been foreshadowing and prophesying about a dying Messiah. But for hundreds of hundreds of years, the Jews didn't know this until it actually happened, which how does that differ from like prophecies of, of Nostradamus, you know? Because in Nostradamus, I can show you exactly where it predicts 9-11, you know, like the lion is going to attack two towers or something like that. But the fact that it's only recognizable as a prophecy after the fact is like a very strong evidence that we are not actually dealing with a prophetic text. I, I'm sure that Cam will have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the argument here seems to be relying on this case that uh, some, or effectively that no Jews uh, could um, either have found it plausible or could have innovated an idea of a suffering and dying Messiah. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think it's the case that Jesus existed and that he actually died and that what happened here is a process of coming to terms with the meaning of Jesus's death uh, that caused him to gain a lot of uh, theological layers derived from the Old Testament based upon interpreting scripture. Um, but as Camille points out, there are plausible um, places within the Old Testament and statements from New Testament authors indicating that the earliest Christians believed the death of Jesus to be in concert with the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And so it puts you in this very difficult position of uh, if you claim that it was found within the Old Testament, then it's pretty hard to say that there could be no expectation um, or no uh, possible uh, sort of understanding of the death of the Messiah. And just to bolster the Acts case about Peter, uh, we also do find in the, uh, the Corinthian creed, the, from um, the first epistle to the Corinthians, um, we find this phrase, uh, according to the scriptures mm -hmm. or in accordance with the scriptures. People interpret it different ways, um, but uh, I at least take it to mean that uh, the reference to mean the Old Testament. And so when uh, Paul says that uh, he died, um, according to the scriptures. Um, you know, I don't rule out that what he's saying there is that, yeah, he also died in history and, um, and you know, we know about this from historical information from the prior apostles. But I, I do take it to be the case that he's also saying you can find this in the Old Testament as well. Yeah, like it was, um, that it was prophesied that he would die. That's effectively, I mean, it very, seems, always seems to me very difficult to read that as anything else than in the Old Testament. It's said that the 
the Messiah would die, and he did, according to what it said. And that seems to me the straightforward reading of that Corinthian creed phrase. Um, but I think that the, the bottom line about this just seems to me that it's possible to read, it seems, I mean, I would see what you guys think about this, right? But it just seems that it's possible to read the Old Testament stuff in lots of different ways. Right? It's just, it's not clear exactly what it means. And you, you can be perfectly reasonable in reading a passage a certain way and coming to the conclusion, like with Nostradamus or whatever, and coming to the conclusion that it's prophesying a certain thing happening and some other guy comes along perfectly reasonable in reading it a different way and coming to a different conclusion. And what I think that that kind of ambiguity and uncertainty is being downplayed in this part of the speech. And we'll see, he goes so on. Too. Yeah, I think he, he um, this is the beginning of a section where it seems to me um, there's this attempt to say that all Jews <laughs> in this period or whatever thought the same way about these crucial fundamental issues of their religion. Um, and I find that, I kind of partly find that offensive because it's, to me, it's kind of dehumanizing to a group that would have, you know, individuals capable of thinking for themselves. And I know that religions can, in certain cases, be quite monolithic about the way that they control belief and stuff. But at the same time, um, there were loads of Jews Right, it wasn't like just some one community or something. It was the whole like countryside full of Jewish people, and to the idea that they wouldn't have had small communities diverging with one another on the way they read ambiguous passages in the Old Testament, frankly, just seems it seems to me insulting to to them that they would they wouldn't that they'd all be so like as if you could define you know and this horrible phrase the Jew. And what the Jew mm. thinks about something, right? That's already cr cringeworthy, right? And it's kind of like <laughs> troubling that so that the argument would like have taints of that. Um, but yeah, that that's what stood out to me. Yeah, j just for the record, I personally don't think Caleb is racist against the Jews because he's worshiping one as a god. So <laughs> I'm not saying he's racist, and I'm, I mean it's a Nazi-like phrase, right? And I'm not saying he's he's Nazi. I'm just saying that um, that to the extent that you downplay the obvious inevitable diversity within a, within a group, what you're doing is characterizing them. And that is the same um, vector as racism. Like that's dehuman, mm. dehumanizing and pretending that a group is all monolithic. Right? Yeah, suggesting people all have one attribute. Um, and I, yeah. so I think that there's like a, a wide case to be made that bears on this in a narrow case. So like in the wider case, I think that we can appeal to the fact and present day evidence that there is a large number of sincere individuals that interpret both the New and the Old Testament and literature in general in a multitude of ways, yeah. in a multiplicity. So it's clear that um, literature and even ones that you consider to be holy scripture have and allow for many different understandings. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that from present day experience, but on the narrow case, we can also show that this is also true of um, uh, a variety of Jewish people in the first century. We find at Qumran a practice of interpreting the Old Testament and gleaning additional information from it by the combination of various passages together informs like uh, Pesher and the Pesherim and, and uh, practices of Midrash. So, and we also find, you know, authors like Philo of Alexandria synthesizing Greek philosophy with uh, forms and mm -hmm. interpretations of Judaism, many of which take on a rather esoteric or, um, you know, uh, metaphorical character that goes well beyond what is being suggested uh, of some, you know, monolith of belief of Jews in the first century. Yeah. Yeah, I would add to that. Yeah, I mean, it's very important to emphasize like a plurality of Second Temple Jewish thought, because not only was it not uh, like a very monolithic uh, religious system, it was actually very like uh, pluralistic and very innovative. So 
there was mm -hmm. like a lot of religious innovation going on at the time. But like the same can be said about uh, specifically finding Jesus in the Old Testament among Christians, right? Because even in antiquity, you find that like different Christian groups found Jesus in different places in the Old Testament. And sometimes it's like you have to wonder why is it the case that they thought this specific passage is talking about Jesus? Because there isn't really any good reason for that. Like, for example, there was a group of Christians, ancient Christians, who believed that um, the serpent in the garden was actually uh, Jesus. <laughs> you know, like, it was a leg they really did believe it. It was a legitimate component of their theology, you know. Um, Christians differ today. Like, it, it, there are even theological disputes about what is and isn't Christophany, and it's connected to, like, a re the religious beliefs. Um, and again, like, the reasoning is often very vague. Like, the, uh, I of some like once I asked a Christian who claimed that Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament if he's also found in the book of Esther, because that's very famously a book where God is not even mentioned. Um, and he said, of course, because Esther was willing to uh, sacrifice herself for her nation. So that's like a prefigurement of Jesus, you know. Like if that kind of reasoning is um, taking place today, why not in the first century, right? Mm -hmm. Like we even have examples, and this is really interesting, of Christians being convinced that pagan literature has allusions to Jesus, mm -hmm. like pre-Christian pagan uh, literature. Um, there are like specific cases, again, that, 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 that I can name. So it seems to me that Christians are like really good in finding Jesus in all kinds of places. And uh, yeah, the, the argument yeah, that it's toast. not like, it, it's very, <laughs> it, the argument that it's not very reasonable to make those kinds of assumptions or it makes those kinds of assumptions. It's not like it's ever stopped anyone, you know? So it yeah. seems to me kind of plausible. Definitely more plausible than an actual resurrection, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, and then the danger there is if you admit that there is like a plurality of distinct uh, religious views within this community at the time, then the idea that some of them innovated a distinct theology here, um, uh, is is suddenly present, right? Like the the move here is a kind of controlling one to try and like downplay that possibility because then by controlling that parameter, you're making it like even less plausible that that they would have come to believe this thing, right? So that, that's it's, it's the kind of straitjacket that's making it saying it's, it's seem like there's no way they could have broken out of this straitjacket unless a miracle happened. Um, and by saying it's not quite clear that they were necessarily in that straitjacket. Right, that means that there's other ways they might have come to believe this thing without a miracle actually happening. That's essentially what seems to me. Yeah, and of course, it's it's always important to realize that like the the explanation that we are coming up uh, against uh, is um, a resurrection, right? So mm -hmm. I'm perfectly happy to bite a bullet on all kinds of things and like concede that various components of competing explanations, for example, of my uh, competing explanation, mm -hmm. are like fairly impossible, which means that if, if I'm starting somewhere here in terms of the prior probability, the, the, the various pieces of uh, or the various components of my hypothesis being fairly implausible on like a background knowledge uh, lowers that epistemic credence. But you have to still remember that the resurrection hypothesis is such a low prior. It's like so far down in this direction is actually hovering somewhere about Fiji on the opposite <laughs> side of the planet, right? So like, it's always important to keep in mind that there is this balance of probabilities. Yeah. Okay, should we, uh, should we crack on? Okay. But none of them thought that resurrections would happen before the end of the world. None of them. The I'm Jews sorry. knew about grief visions. They knew when people very close for a very long time had passed away. Um, the person who was mourning the deceased might occasionally have transient visions of one sensory modality and so on. They knew about these things and they had terms for these things. They would never have said resurrection and they didn't in any other circumstance. They called these things exaltation or just a feeling that that person was still with them. They talked about the idea of being in Abraham's bosom, a place where the deceased went uh, in a kind of paradisical way. Uh, they talked about apparitions. They knew that grief visions weren't the same as resurrections. Resurrection was something else entirely. 
And so it's clear simply from the meaning of resurrection, the Greek anastasis, that any Jew willing to undergo such a radical shift in their beliefs against all their biases must have had a very compelling and determinate experience to convince them that someone had been raised from the dead. Okay, so this, it seems to me, is a bit where it stood out when I listened to this. I kind of like dropped my coffee or whatever and was like, say what? Because I, you can't have it both ways, right? This, is, this feels to me like he's having, trying to have it both ways. I get what he's saying, which is, it seems to me, look, these guys um, were in a kind of cultural, religious kind of straitjacket in their worldview. And they just wouldn't have believed in resurrection. That's totally against what they thought. Um, and also, they were quite sophisticated um, in evaluating claims of resurrections by the sounds of it, because they all come, all of them, again, it's completely uh, monolithic, they all come equipped with um, knowledge about grief uh, visions or whatever, um, and then they know exactly what the difference is between somebody feeling sad that they lost a loved one and thinking they've seen them again, and an actual resurrection, so much so that they would not believe that that had happened if someone told them, unless they had solid evidence to persuade them. So they kind of like, they've got this kind of good skeptical um, outlook, which would prevent them from coming to a false belief about resurrection. Um, and okay, so the point of that is to try and say, look, these guys who claimed to see it take place wouldn't have just believed some, you know, grief vision, or whatever, right? They, they wouldn't have come to that belief unless they had really good evidence really solid, something like really good. Um, so that must mean that they had really good evidence, right? Because they came to that belief. That seems to be the kind of like way this argument is going. But then the bit seems to me that you can't have it both ways is, you know, most people who came to believe in Christianity weren't in that position of seeing Jesus with their own eyes, of having that um, really solid evidence, right? So most people would just be in the position of hearing it from somebody else. Well, you know, presumably that person telling them that also wasn't even there themselves, right? And yet we know from history that large numbers of people converted, like Jews converted to Christianity. I mean, if all of these Jews had this like armoured skeptic outlook and knew everything about um, grief visions and had a worldview which completely forbid the idea of anyone ever being resurrected, you know, given that most of them didn't have any other evidence apart from hearsay, how can they all change their minds, right? Like, you can't have it both ways, right? If he's right about the monolithic nature of their outlook and their, like, absolute scepticism towards that type of thing taking place, you know, such that they must have had really good evidence, right? Then most of them wouldn't have believed it. It would have just been a handful of people who saw it for themselves who would have believed it, and everyone else would have gone, man, you must have had a grief vision, or, you know, that's completely alien to my worldview, so I'm not going to take your hearsay as a reason to convert and adopt a belief that's completely antithetical to my um, religious outlook, such as bodily resurrection or whatever. So you can't have it both ways. You know, it makes, it makes the spread through testimony of Christianity completely inexplicable, if he's right about that. Yeah, well, have to, you have to remember that when it comes to those other Jews that didn't experience the appearances of Jesus, there is, of course, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's uh, this is uh, uh, something that apologists do very often when they kind of um, talk about the, the, the mindset that people in the first century would be in, right? They conflate how rational a belief is to believe with how probable it is that early Christians would have become convinced of it, right? Uh, so Callum here is basically saying that like, if the belief in the resurrection was unreasonable to believe by a standard of like a 21st century, you know, post enlightenment rationalistic skeptic, mm -hmm. then it's very probable that early Christians would be convinced by it. But I don't think that's very true because, you know, as you said, uh, you know, be people are convinced of unreasonable beliefs all the time, even today, even contrary to like a very good evidence. Yeah. Um, even though like we, today we have, you know, ne nearly universal literacy and almost instant access to information and stuff like that. I imagine how much that must have been wor uh, how, how worse that would be in like first century among Ill illiterate uh, fishermen in rural Palestine. Like I, I think if we today wanted to approximate the kind of mindset that, you know, the, 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 these people would have, what we need to do is go to like a rural Afghanistan and find some goat herder and ask him about epistemology and about like uh, 
critically evaluating evidence and ruling out competing explanations. Mm -hmm. And we would probably find out that his like critical thinking skills are severely lacking. And that's why he believes like all kinds of things that are not reasonable to believe. So again, like what's more probable, you know, an actual resurrection versus uh, religious people becoming convinced of something, even though they don't have very good reasons to, seems to me the second <laughs> thing happens all the time, right? Yeah, and much like in the way um, specifically uh, hallucinations, <laughs> to bring up that word, those ones that occur at uh, the barrier between sleeping and waking and waking and sleeping, that these hallucinations obvious, uh, sorry, often play out within the framework or the ontology of the believer. So, for example, if you are... Uh, a person who has in your conceptual um, sort of framework the concept of aliens, uh, these waking, sleeping style hallucinations will often play out with the content of aliens and abductions and mm. visitations from outer space. And within certain um, religious traditions who have like a conceptual framework of uh, demons and angels and things like this these types of hallucinations will play out within uh, the framework i mean not necessarily but it does occur um but which is not to say that i'm hypothesizing specifically that it was like waking sleeping hallucinations that occurred um but i do think that that's quite a plausibility um but the other aspect is that when Cullum talks about this stuff, especially when he mentions uh, the, motor, the multi-modality of the experiences, I think that um, it comes back to what Robert Price calls uh, the Yellow Brick Road. I think given Cullum's plausibility um, framework, in particular that he takes it to be the case that the contents of the gospels are reliable are a reliable guide to what happened in the past i think there's a lot of importation of the narrative of meeting Jesus after his death into um, a sort of uh, hypothesizing about what it is that the earliest Christians who came to believe Jesus rose from the dead actually experienced. And um, I think the difficulty here is that this, uh, these multimodal style uh, experiences that are priming these hypotheses, they only come in the nar narrative literature of the Gospels many decades after what are these initial experiences and we actually have a absence of good evidence that is any attestation from individuals who's purportedly experienced these things um, from the first century so for example we don't actually have any writings that we can reliably determine came from anybody other than paul that you know give witness to any of these experiences um, and Paul's uh, attestation doesn't go to justify any kind of claim of multimodality, or at least, um, you know, what is being imagined in the case of the gospel literature. Well, isn't it the case that Paul sees a bright light and hears a noise? Wouldn't that count as multimodal? No, that's, that's actually, this is, I don't understand why, but everyone <laughs> makes this kind of error, even people who are very knowledgeable of the Bible, like, a, you know, new atheists coming from religious background and Christians, they think that the Damascus Road experience, so, you know, like Paul hearing a voice and seeing a light and falling from a donkey, is actually narrated by Paul. But that's actually not true. That's found in the book of Acts. And like a part of my uh, explanation is that that's a fictional narrative specifically modeled after a conversion of Heliodorus, who was a Greek persecutor of the Jews, which is narrated in Second Maccabees, uh, which is, uh, I mean, it can be shown that the author of Acts had access to that book and used it elsewhere. Um, so, so yeah, surprisingly enough, Paul says very little about the nature of his like visions, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that a lot of the things that he says can be explained not uh, by him, like the nature of his vision, 
visions, but for example, why would he already believed in virtue of his like uh, Jewish background, right? So for example, he um, describes how Je like the Jesus' resurrected body and how the future resurrected bodies are going to look like, what they are made of and stuff like that. Um, but he never actually says, you know, I know this because I touched Jesus. It seems to me that it was mm -hmm. just a component of his existing beliefs. He mentions once how he, even though he doesn't say exactly that it was him, visited heaven. But, yeah. That, uh, well, I mean, that, in that account, what he explicitly says is whether in the body or out of the body. So he, he actually yeah. gives acknowledgement to that whoever it was that was experiencing this, um, you know, it's rather plausible he's talking about himself. Um, he gives acknowledgement that there's uncertainty about whether or not it was him actually physically being taken up to heaven to be shown these things, or whether or not it was just an experience in the mind being delivered by God. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't want to press on the multi-modality point too much to say that it couldn't be the case that there was sort of auditory and visual. That's not what I'm attempting to say. It's actually more to do with, like, um, making people aware of the difficulty in importing the content of the Gospels specifically into our hypothesis formulation about what these experiences were. Um, because there are many uh, sort of types of experience that are more in the psychological realm that are compatible with what our earliest evidence suggests, though absolutely not compatible with what we find in the Gospels. So just to press this a little bit more, I think that uh, um, apologists, those defending the resurrection, are absolutely right to say that if what if you if what you are imagining is that the contents of the gospels, that is these narrative stories about touching Jesus, etc., are what the disciples hallucinated, and they all hallucinated that, you're being ridiculous. And like, I really think that. I think that that's such an absurd hypothesis. This idea that the disciples hallucinated, you know, touching Jesus's wounds or eating fish with him by the, you know, eating with him by the lakeside. That to me is just absurd. I do not think that that's a plausible hypothesis to explain the content of early Christianity. But it must make you confused then, because how is it that you think that I am explaining the content if you don't think that that's what my hypothesis is? And so I think that there's a misidentification about what the non-believer in the resurrection is saying. They're not saying that what was hallucinated is the content of the Gospels. No, we explain that in literary terms. We think that these are constructed stories using Old Testament elements, using standard tropes from the Greco-Roman and Jewish literary world, and using the imagination of a creative author. What we think that we're explaining when we're talking about um, hallucination or visions or this type of thing is the, the, um, the sufficient content to explain the origin of the belief in Jesus's resurrection, content that unfortunately we have no uh, authors who are first person narrators of those experiences, except for Paul. Yeah, and it's tempting to think of um, a, a story you could tell that would explain that, which involves maybe one or two influential people um, having um, something far less concrete and specific uh, type of out of body or like strange um, experience, and then coming to say to their followers or people who are primed to. Um, want to think that what they're saying is true something like oh i just saw jesus and he came to me or whatever and then that's us taking off i mean i think yeah, there I think. are probably claims sorry there's, i think there's probably examples and if i'd done any research i probably would have had them planned but there are probably examples i mean it just it seems quite plausible you can imagine a kind of cult leader saying something like that and everyone going oh i had a vision too yeah me too yeah i definitely did or whatever and it just taking off i mean that sort of thing uh, even though any specific story I tell is going to be quite implausible, seems at least <laughs> like that could happen. Like there's no, you know, it's not that unlikely that something like that would happen. So yeah, you're right. You don't need to hypothesize some 
you know, multimodal um, set of hallucinations that's shared by lots of people. It seems to me just have one or two sort of strange things and they're taking off as kind of group thing. Yeah, I, I think I can do even better than that <laughs> because you know I like to I like to meet apologists where they're at at much as much as possible, right? So I have a horse in the race uh, myself, and I I think this might be my innovation. At least I haven't had, like seen it anywhere in literature. So I like. Obviously, the way how would I would explain the contents of the Gospels, like Jesus eating a piece of fish and breaking bread with the two disciples and stuff like that, would be the way how Cam is explaining it. But I would be willing to grant for the sake of argument that like the First Corinthians 15 expl um, is um, a narrative about an actual event, like a, about uh, some appearance that uh, people um, experience. The thing is, it doesn't give you any details about where it happened, when, how much time took place between like various individuals and groups of people seeing Jesus supposedly. It could be years, minutes, we don't know because it mm -hmm. doesn't say. It doesn't say anything about people touching Jesus. It just uses the word for seeing, which also has like a very wide range, but fair enough, right? Um, uh, but it, the important like data point uh, is that it says, uh, for example, 500 people saw Jesus at the same time. And, you know, apologists will very often say that it's very improbable, like this is very improbable uh, if your explanation is something that's internal to the mind of the individual because that can't be shared with mm -hmm. people, right? So the obvious move would be to say, okay, this isn't a description of an actual event. That's something that developed over time, for example. But I'm actually granting it is. And my explanation would be pareidolia, which is defined as an incorrect perception of a sensory stimulus as a meaningful pattern, which is known to the observer. And we have a lot of examples of pareidolia, which have religious significance across different religions. Uh, for example, in Catholicism, those are like apparitions of Virgin Mary, which take place all the time. Mm -hmm. M many people can see it at the same time. They can like corroborate the experience because it's an actual thing that, you know, people can look at. Um, and what's interesting is that the language that people use make you think that they are actually talking about like a, a much more interesting experience of seeing Mary than what is actually the case if you go on and investigate it, right? So it seems to me it lines up very nicely with uh, this kind of creed. And I was also able to found a lot of like other candidate phenomena depicted in ancient literature where pareidolia could be a viable explanation. Because unfortunately, you know, there were no skeptics running around in ancient times, like fact-checking those claims. But I think there are like, what motivates the plausibility is that if this was an actual explanation, then we would expect like a di different phenomena being recorded in ancient literature, which could also be plausibly explained by pareidolia. And yeah, they are like all, all over the place. Uh, I would be able to again give some examples. So there you go. Well, how about you give um, just for the sake of fleshing it out, um, a concrete example of what kind of pareidolia could explain this claim of the 500, sure. as well as giving one example of other content in ancient literature that could likewise be explained by such a hypothesis. Okay, cool. So I'll give you the entire First Corinthians 15 creed, right? <laughs> so... Imagine that a large group of early Christians is walking outside one day and suddenly they see a Jesus-shaped cloud. Cephas sees it first, then the 12, then more than 500 brethren see it at the same time, then James see it, and then finally all of the apostles see it. They already believe that Jesus uh, was the Messiah. They already believe that Jesus was raised because that's what the Old Testament says. They already believe that he was uh, lifted up and highly exalted in heaven and that it's currently sitting uh, next to God on the right-hand side of the celestial throne. This is like seals the deal. And that's how the story uh, starts and the rest is history, right? Like, is this ridiculous? Of course it is, but <laughs> These kind of things happened all the time. Seems to me it's so much more probable than resurrection, right? And uh, 
the other examples, like candidate explanations, would be, for example, portents uh, or like divine omens that are recorded in uh, like ancient Greek and Roman sources that specifically have to do with uh, like meteorological or astro um, celestial phenomena. Like, for example, seeing crosses in the sky. Uh, seeing chariots riding around in the sky, seeing like armies uh, fighting battles and stuff like that. Like I don't think that not I don't necessarily think that every instance where we have this uh, narrated in the ancient sources points to an actual event. Like I'm sure that like the, this was like a normal literary convention that was a tradition for people to put forward this kind of divine signs. But what I'm saying is that it's plausible that like one of the, mo the, the motivating factors behind a specific type of this kind of phenomena could be pareidolia, just as some uh, contemporary historians of like ancient history pointed out that some uh, divine signs in ancient literature could be a product of volcanic activity and they also noted that they often that they appear more often in uh, ancient literature, written in places that were more volcanically active, active at the time. For example, blood rain, which could be explained mm -hmm. as uh, volcanic ash being mixed with normal rain, and uh, like stones or rocks or dirt falling from the sky, which again is just a, like a product of volcanic activity. So it's again doesn't seem that implausible to suggest that they might be something else, uh, like something similar, going mm -hmm. on with pareidolia. So I, I want to clarify the logic here. So first of all, it's acknowledged that such an explanation is improbable. You know, like it's owned and understood and agreed that it's not a likely suggestion, and so it needs to be understood. But go back to the logic of historical explanation I gave before, what we're talking about is competing hypotheses that equally explain the contents of, you know, the literature that we're attempting to account for. When it's the case that they equally explain it, now it might be objected that it's not equally explained, but let's presume for the moment that it is, when that content's equally explained, it caches out in an analysis of the priors. And so what's really occurring here is a comparison of which hypothesis do you think is more probable intrinsically? If we acknowledge it's equally explaining the data, then is pareidolia more um, common than resurrection? Well, yes, I mean, I think that most, uh, you know, answers to that question if they're giving um giving credence to our background knowledge of what happens more commonly in human history pareidolia or resurrection i think that they must admit that it's a pretty good and more likely hypothesis now it might be objected that it's not equally explanatory but perhaps later on we can talk about how there's a good uh, case to be made that resurrection hypotheses are not explanatory either yeah, and I can bite the bullet on it being not like very explanatory, right? Uh, like even if it was the case that an actual appearance of Jesus would have, like it, the probability of the appearances given the resurrection was like one or very close to one. I can bite the bullet that mine is much much lower. What's important that it's not astronomically lower, which I don't think it is. So again, like I, I'm perfectly happy to drop like the epistemic credence in that specific hypothesis even further because I think again like the I have uh, enough wiggle room for me to do that given where the other explanation is right <laughs> yeah the claim here is like the degree to which it uh, doesn't explain or less successfully explains the data is not worse than the degree to which pareidolia is more probable than resurrection Yeah, right. So it's like, I once spent about half an hour searching my flat for, um, I think it was a bag. Um, and I almost got to the point of thinking, because the window was open, but it was a second floor flat. And I almost got to the point of like looking out the window and trying to work out, could someone have climbed up the outside of this building 
and just stolen like my coat or my bag, whatever it was, and nothing else, and just left by the window without me noticing. Because like, where the fuck is it? Right? And I think what had happened in, in the end was I'd just forgotten to bring it back with me from wherever I was, right? And you know, both of those hypotheses perfectly well explain the absence of the bag or whatever it was. Um, and given my frustration at trying to find it, right, I was having to start countenancing unlikely things happening. Um, when it occurred to me that, oh, maybe I just left it around my friend's house, right, suddenly the explanatory, they were equally explanatory, but the much higher prior probability of like me being a forgetful idiot suddenly made me think, oh, that's definitely what happened, right? At least I'm now no longer worried about the idea that somebody's sort of spider man his way <laughs> off the wall and into my house to randomly steal one worthless item and leave again. So the prior probability of that, that that's what's a kind of crude analogy for what, what we're talking about here. Uh, as long if the two hypotheses are equal in terms of explaining it, and let's, let's face it, it doesn't seem like it's that difficult to cook up hypotheses that could explain this data equally. Yeah, um, and then you're important. just looking at what's more intrinsically probable. Yeah, and it's, it's important to realize that like, what I'm offering is just one out of like a pretty large disjunction of all kinds of hypotheses that are anything other than the resurrection, right? Some of them are going to fail, but I think there is enough of them that like the disjunction is probably going to be more probable. And I think in your uh, analogy, like uh, uh, if the better analogy would be even better if the uh, hypothesis that you ended up uh, entertaining would be like an actual super climbing like in it, it, you know it, it being a situation where someone would really need like a superhuman abilities yeah, to right, right, climb right. to the window right because that would obviously lower the the prior probability even further so but what's going on here with Cullum and his epistemology from what I can tell is that he recognizes that um he needs to cut away the possibility of the types of failed epistemic processes occurring within these first century believers. So what he appears to need to do or think is necessary is to say, you know, they couldn't been, uh, they couldn't have been so unsuccessful uh, of uh, critical thinkers that they would find themselves believing uh, their Messiah had raised from the dead on the basis of such measly evidence or such invalid inferences, et cetera, et cetera. So like for him, it's like, it must be, it, well, and I, I feel a bit mean talking about him um, in this way, but, but I think what's going on in his head is that, um, you know, it, if they did come to believe this is it must be the case that they were using some kind of good critical faculties to um to believe it but i just think that the evidence both of the first century and our general history rules against that it's very common for people to um come to false beliefs on the basis of really poor evidence it happens mm -hmm. routinely and it shouldn't be surprising um, even if you can't quite imagine how they would do so, I, how common it is, um, it's it, maybe a way of cashing this out is that it's, um, it's, it's more common to be mistaken about extremely improbable claims than it is to be correct. Um, it, it's kind of a weird way of phrasing it, but it's like what we find in history is that it's actually really common for people to be mistaken about extra, like, a, you know, claims that contradict or strongly go against our background knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, now it sounds like we're almost phrasing it um, in Hume's argument against miracles, right? I mean, does yeah, I think that, that there is a point? bit of that going on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, look, I think we've still only done about six minutes. <laughs> Let's see what else Callum's got to say. Yeah. Or uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. Even more so for a whole group of Jews. They must have had ostensible appearances of Jesus, risen from the dead, more compelling than mere feelings or grief visions. They must have been able to have conversed with him, spoken with him and touched him all in one go. They must have been able to verify these things and visions with each other. And 
to just to pause, just to, I'm hammering this point again, but they must have been able to touch him. They must have been able to do all of this stuff. Like what? How do you, like, none of that follows. I want to see the inference for that. Like, that's sort of like a point at where I would really demand, like, please show me the inference. Must have been, really? Like... Yeah. <laughs> But also, um, none of the other people who didn't get the opportunity to see Jesus or be with him, none of those people needed that, even though they're all part of the same homogenous community and all had exactly the same sceptical attitudes. Um, only the people who needed to be believed, or only the people who were in the position to have the evidence, um, had that uh, outlook, apparently, everyone else was willing to just accept a bunch of stuff people told them. <laughs> without the access to that. Anyway, so we've, we've already hammered this point home. I'm just pausing again because it's so egregious once you think about it like that to hear him saying it. Ah, anyway, right, let's carry on. Given their knowledge of the tomb's location, it's unthinkable that they would risk their lives and everything they had by proclaiming the resurrection without just checking that the tomb was empty to begin with. It is even more unthinkable that the authorities who wanted to abolish Christianity would let them continue without checking the tomb that they themselves provided. But we know that after Jesus' death, his followers did precisely that. And we know all of this without even looking at a single Christian historical document. But of course, we've also been endowed with a number of early sources written by early Christians who either knew Jesus or who knew his close followers. Much earlier and more numerous than for almost any other ancient... Yeah, yeah. So there is a kind of weird thing that just went on there where he said, like, something to the effect of we know all of this on the basis of external evidence to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But like, hold on, what? <laughs> like, there is a lot of specific stuff that he claimed there, like that isn't, I mean, I, I, I don't know, like I'm just bemused as to how he think he's yeah, justified I, that Yeah, I actually right? took some notes of the things that he said in the section, which I take him to intend to be only based on non-Christian sources. And he said stuff like, it's implausible that early Christians wouldn't remember where Jesus was buried just one and a half days ago. Where is it in Suetonius? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, um, it's just... I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, just the Simonium Flavianum has something about three days, right? But whether that's authentic and uh, how it actually looked like originally, that's uh, not uh, historically, like beyond, beyond historical doubt, you know? Well, um, yeah, there's lots of, uh, well, I sh quite a number of um, contemporary and uh, within the 20th century um, discussions of Josephus's testimony in Flavianum who hold that the whole thing is a forgery. Now, I think that the current consensus is that there is some uh, authentic material there, um, but that w all we can do is... Uh, create a probable reconstruction uh, that we're not certain in. But yeah, I think this is way going well beyond the evidence. Mm -hmm. Shall I continue? Historical figure. So let me make some preliminary remarks here. Firstly, nothing in my case relies on the authors of the Gospels being eyewitnesses themselves. I think there is excellent internal and external evidence that they are all based substantially on eyewitness testimony, and even that John and perhaps Matthew are eyewitnesses themselves. But any evidence for these only adds to the already powerful historical case given by the accounts in the Gospels, which are hugely and substantially based on eyewitness testimony. Secondly, Nothing in my case relies on the substantial historicity and general reliability of the Gospels as a whole. Again, there are powerful arguments for this, but my case does not rely on them. There are many features of the resurrection accounts in particular, specifically, which betray those um, historical marks of the resurrection accounts. I don't need to rely on the general reliability of the Gospels. So then, it will be misguided if Greg chooses to challenge this information by objecting to problems with the Gospels and with Paul's letters, or by raising questions about whether the writers themselves were eyewitnesses. I don't know if he'll do that because his argument has mainly been a philosophical one from the laws of nature, but he might do. But he can't just say that I've assumed the Gospel writers are eyewitnesses, and he can't say that the Gospels are generally unreliable, so we can't accept their resurrection narratives. Those moves won't work. Indeed, most of the pertinent facts can be established from non-Christian history alone. But let me briefly summarize a small portion of the supplementary evidence the Gospels and Epistles supply. 
So for the empty tomb, we have female witnesses, stark and unsanitized in all four Gospels in the New Testament. Women's testimony was so dismissed in Jewish culture that the only time it was not considered worthless is if there was no other testimony available. If the stories about the empty tomb were made up, they would not have cited women as the primary witnesses. So I just want to pause just because um, we hear this claim a lot about the idea that um, the female witnesses, because of the unreliable nature of female testimony, um, that that's a sign of authenticity, of that aspect of the narrative. You know, they wouldn't make that up because they're unreliable witnesses. Um, and I wonder what you guys think of that. Well, it could be a double bluff, right? Like if you were uh, creating a fictional account, putting in unreliable wit eyewitnesses is exactly what you would do because then everybody would think <laughs> that you wouldn't make it up. I know, uh, I think you, you might uh, adjust your microphone because somehow worse than it was before. Am I qu too quiet? Alex. Hello? Can you hear me? I don't know, Cam. How, how, how does it... I can hear you, Cam. Uh, what do you think? Is it... Um... Yeah, I can hear you. It does seem to have changed a little bit. That's um, weird. No, it's... Um, okay, I think I was just leaning back in my chair, chillaxing too much. Yeah, I, I, so, but seriously, like, um, there was a lot of um, obviously said about the criterion of embarrassment and like whether it would actually be embarrassing and how much that counts as evidence and whatnot. But I think there is like one important meta point that people don't make very often and it's that, okay, like let's say that it would be embarrassing, but I think uh, there are some like unstated assumptions which I, which needs to be the case, but I think are actually false, right? Uh, and like one unstating assumption is that one of the literary goals of the gospel authors was to create a narrative which would be convincing for Christian in the first place, because only then is an embarrassing story unexpected on the hypothesis that the narrative is fictional. But I think this is probably false, even if the empty tomb story is historical, because you have to remember that the entirety of the empty tomb narrative as narrated in all of the gospels is actually not embarrassing. Because yes, it's true that the tomb was originally discovered by women, but then male disciples went and confirmed it. So on the assumption that the, the discovery of the empty tomb is historical, and that one of the goals of the gospel authors was to create a, a convincing story for non-Christians, it's very unexpected that both the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew would omit uh, the confirmation by the male disciples, right? Like, why would they shoot themselves in the foot by making that kind of omission? And you can, uh, you know, propose some explanations, but they are either to be hawk or they will work equally well with a fictional story. Like, for example, you can say that the confirmation of the male disciples was in an original lost ending to the Gospel of Mark works just as well with a fictional story, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that like a much better explanation for those omissions is that the gospels were written primarily for a Christian audience. So for was based, probably roughly for the same reasons that Christians are convinced uh, of it today. So the discovery of the empty tomb being embarrassing and not very convincing for a non-Christian audience just wasn't a concern for the gospel authors. Right, so <clears throat> what I find difficult with these types of presentations and what I find about them that is similar to the argumentative strategy that folks like Lycona and Habermas employ, that is the minimal facts, it's that it's very selective in its presentation of the fruits of New Testament scholarship. Mm -hmm. So what we find here is a listing of claims and a listing of things that are, or claims that I think are taken by Cullum to be true, that he thinks bear on and give positive evidence towards, you know, this idea of an empty tomb. Mm -hmm. 
But what it doesn't do is enumerate or give examination to the competing hypotheses and the data that is less expected on this and that's where I think that like this broad thing becomes undone and generally literary hypotheses become very likely to be the um, the explanatory uh, reality of the subsequent gospels to the gospel of Mark and I don't maybe I'll go into it a little bit but effectively like if you line the gospels up side by side and you look at how the story changes and then you consider um, the dominant hypotheses in New Testament scholarship today about the literary relationships between these gospels what you find is that there are direct um even rhetorical uh, changes that occur between the sources um, we find uh so and caven actually gets into this a little bit he shows how on the assumption of a literary hypothesis that the author of the gospel of matthew wants to have jesus's prediction of the disciples seeing uh jesus in galilee causes you know on the assumption that the Matthean author had that motive we find totally expected what uh resurrection tradition and um you know the the contents of the empty tomb narrative we find in matthew um and the yeah I'm, I'm not being super clear here but the idea is that like when you begin to look at the gospels as a whole and you begin to look at the literary relationships between them, no longer does it seem plausible that the contents of these stories arise from historical information that the author possess. Instead, it becomes more probable that the contents of the stories arise from literary motivations. Mm -hmm. And this can be seen, you know, if you just go and read New Testament literature, or, or sorry, like contemporary New Testament scholarship on these stories. Um, like, I mean, one example is that like John seems to have some very, uh, strong motives around having Jesus adhere to the Jewish burial customs. And so there is information inserted about like the way that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea prepared the body for burial. Um, the author of Luke appears to have a desire to show that the origin of Christianity, both, um, in his, uh, in the book of Acts and the Lucan narrative that the origin of it comes from Jerusalem, whereas Matthew has, you know, the placement of the origin of the, you know, the story in Galilee, um, consistent with the predictions found in the gospel of Mark. You find that uh, the, the Matthean author includes this, uh, you know, the story about the guards that no other um, gospel presents and its earlier um, source it's redacting from the gospel of mark doesn't present at all um it uh there is uh the the changing descriptions or the discrepant uh, depictions of a young man um uh, angels or men at the tomb in mm. various narratives and you know their their associated descriptions there's the competing accounts about who it was that went to the tomb to confirm for example in the gospel of john you have this race uh, between Peter and the beloved disciples to, to the tomb. And, you know, when you start actually looking at all of these details, the rosy kind of picture we get painted here, I think really starts to slip away. And these claims become much more debatable. And instead, it starts to look like literary hypotheses explain this content quite well. And so on that theme, then, um, I've heard it being said, so I want to know what you guys think of this, that there's a way of, um, I guess, explaining some of the, let's say, literary choices found in Mark. If you think of him having a kind of aesthetic of, um, what's the phrase, like a um, confounding expectation of the yeah, reader. Irony. Of expectation, right? right, right, right. So I think irony is like, I mean, it's not necessarily irony, but like, uh, uh, like I think that there's a really compelling case to be made that um, a form of irony is a strong literary uh, 
method or device that's employed by the author of Mark, mm -hmm. and that there are many examples through the gospel where the um, the reader has information that the characters within the story don't possess, yeah. and it creates excellent, uh, you know, uh, reader response style, uh, you know, appreciation of it as literature that is, you know, it's created by the author. Um, anyway. Continue. But is that the same thing as, um, so that um, where the audience is in possession of knowledge that the characters are not, is that quite the same thing? I, so I'm thinking that the confounding yeah, expectation is slightly yeah, you different. Might be, you might be thinking about something else. So what, what Cam is describing, and I think this is uh, what's the case, is like uh, the, you know, the textbook definition, let's say, of the dramatic irony, which mm -hmm. means that either the narrator or the audience have information that the characters don't have, and that creates like an additional layer of meaning. But I think what you are, um, what you are describing is the fact that like the events depicted in the Gospel of Mark are somehow like subvert an expectation of the like uh, the audience, right? So that would be things like, you know, Jesus doesn't come from a position of place or power. Mm -hmm. He is from like a significant, insignificant area in Galilee. Uh, his male disciples who are closest to him are don't understand him. He is yeah. really the mo most interest, uh, understood by outsiders, like females, demons, the Roman centurion, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's what I'm, stuff that's like what that. I'm talking about. And, um, so, so even some of his sayings, like right, turn the other cheek, uh, the, the the meek shall inherit the kingdom, the the last, the first shall be last, and stuff like that. And the the argument that we are making is that again, what's more probable that like an actual biography of a person would happen to line up such that it creates this like very convenient literary theme or that this is like a product of a literary arrangement, right? And I mm -hmm. think again, like, seems to me that the second is more probable. And it's, so for example, the empty tomb narrative fits directly into that because, uh, you know, in the passion narrative, again, Jesus is being uh, betrayed, uh, rejected and, um, and uh, abandoned by his closest followers, his male disciples. And the people who actually go to the tomb are female disciples who are not like outsiders to within the right. context of I, the community. Exactly, yeah. So I mean, um, and I, I, I'm um, talking to you guys because you know far more about this than me. So um, it seems to me that uh, if you, once you start pulling at that thread, then it's quite easy to imagine um, that you know, there's this guy, Jesus, who really does live and has some followers or whatever, and then he gets killed. Um, and then what happens is this process of like creatively reinterpreting that event and coming up with some way that that event um, has some kind of meaning to it, right? And one way of doing that would be to say, well, look, it's unexpected that that happened, right? Like, I mean, um, but maybe that unexpected thing is actually a super important thing, right? Like it's, um, what would it be like if it was like that? Um, and so once you start like get, getting into the mindset of thinking, well, I guess it's like the anti-hero or something. And obviously the anti-hero then, he wouldn't be good at miracles. He'd sometimes fail and people wouldn't actually understand him. He wouldn't actually bring um, the power to the Jewish nation. He'd actually just die. And, and then, then it's like, well, then there'd be women finding him at the tomb, kind of like fits into that. Like that. It seems to me what I'm trying to say is that if what you were doing was retrofitting a narrative onto the surprising death of a, a leader, um, then I can kind of imagine writing a story like that, you know, and actually it's quite, it would be quite a fun story writing exercise to, to do that type of um anti-hero thing a bit like um yeah so there's superhero films where they're like not actually that good is kick-ass like that i think i might be confusing two things but you know it would make quite an interesting film to have it like confounding the expectations of the the audience in that way i mean I, so i don't know what what am i just coming up yeah with i mean stupid the, 
this no, no i think like that's the type of hypotheses that are at play that are best explaining certain content of the gospel of mark um maybe not specifically but closely related now mm-hmm. so uh, there's two things that i that i wanted to say um one is that even at the heart of the pauline tradition that the author of the gospel of mark stands within we find such kind of uh, analogical thinking. I'm not quite sure how to put it, but so in Galatians, the letter that the author of, uh, that the, that Paul writes to the churches in Galatia, he talks about like how it's the case that, uh, you know, any man who's hung on a tree is cursed and he equates being under the law uh, for the purpose of salvation to being under the curse. And what he says is effectively that like, because um, Jesus, you know, was cursed by being hung on a tree, it's by that means that he lifts uh, the need to be under the curse of the law. And so there's this sort of like um, this type of thinking right present at some of our earliest theologizing of Jesus and the meaning of his death. But then on to what I was going to say about the Gospel of Mark. Yeah, there are these reversals of expectation and they fit in and overlap with the use of irony in Mark. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's also, in my view, a more broad rhetorical strategy of the author that actually has to do with the socio-political situation within early Christianity between competing factions, particularly the Pauline and the Petrine factions of Christianity, and disputes about the nature and understanding of Jesus' death, the law, and um, the concept of a Messiah. And so what you see in uh, Mark's gospel is, you know, not only all of these really interesting examples of, um, you know, Simon of Cyrene carrying Jesus' cross instead of Simon Peter, or, um, you know, this Barabbas being set three instead of Jesus, or... um, uh, this, mm. these various like reversals of expectation, you also find some strong, what it p- appears to be, p- polemical charges against the disciples, the family of Jesus, and in particular the Petrine faction. When we have, in uh, example, um, Peter explicitly affirming and questioning the concept of the Messiah going to a death on a cross and instead holding up these, you know, standard apparently Jewish expectations of a victorious Messiah to the point where um, Jesus in the narrative by Mark is, is, Uh, made to say, you know, get behind me, Satan, for the fact that he doesn't understand the purpose of the Messiah and has this incorrect view. And it's from this sort of like uh, polemical charge against the Petra infection, we find Peter and the disciples are never restored in the Gospel of Mark. We find that going right to the end of the Gospel, there is no restoration narrative. What we find is Jesus deny, uh, sorry, Peter denies Jesus when he says that he won't. He fails to carry Jesus' cross when he says that he will. Um, we find criminals at the right and left hand of Jesus instead of James and John. We find that um, there are, the disciples flee and they wither away as a like the the um like the uh, plants that grow up in rocky soil we find i think quite a charge against a faction within early christianity and so mm-hmm. to think that like we are limiting ourselves only to these sort of naive uh, questions about are uh, women uh, good witnesses to something <laughs> and would you put that in a narrative when really the the actual successful competing explanations of the gospel of mark are far more socio-political um and 
rhetorical, um, at least I claim the best explanations, than what Cullen appears to be imagining. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would just very quickly add to that. Yeah, the, the hypothesis that Mark is like an anti Petrian polemic, that, that's probably too geeky, but it's for like this discussion, but it's true that uh, the first parable in Mark is the parable of the uh, sower, and the male disciples do fit the description of the seed that's thrown on the rocky ground because they follow Jesus immediately. Uh, but when persecution happens, they end up uh, denying him, right? And Peter is named Peter, which means rock, right? So that's uh, pretty obvious that this is going on. Yeah. I don't think there's anything that's off limits in terms of how geeky it is, just, just for the record. I think that's absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> So just to be, just to take it down a level of geekiness, it, the idea is that there are um, explanations of these, the narrative um, features in terms of um, there being competing factions or whatever, at least different factions early on in the development of Christianity. And if it might be that what's going on here is that the author of Mark is saying, these guys, these followers of Peter or whatever, they're a bunch of chumps and it's like taking a swipe at them whilst retelling a version of the story. And I think that there are ways of reading into Shakespearean plays, stuff between like um, different factions of the day, like the, the white rose or whatever stands for like the house of the Habsburgs or something. If you don't know that, you're just like, oh, a white rose, that's nice. But if the people who were listening in those days, it had been like, ha ha, finding it really funny that he's taking a swipe at like, you know, Duke Leopold, blah, 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 whatever, by that like coded reference. So what you're saying is that there's something like that that's, that's a, a way of explaining the yeah, it's, uh, things I would, that are going I would on. Give you, yeah, I would give you even more like a like closer examples. It's like the apologists always like to cl claim that... Um, you know, the Gospels are written in a genre of Greco-Roman historical biography oh, yeah. by Bios, you know, and uh, to to kind of give give the, those texts the cloud. I, I don't think that's the case. I think that the similarities are just a, a byproduct of what's actually true, which is that the Gospels, primarily the Gospel of Mark, is an imitation of the Elijah, Elisha narrative found in First uh, Kings. Uh, but um, if you actually grant that, well, then even like Greco Roman historical biographies of even like characters that actually existed and were like fairly close contemporaries of uh, the, the authors, like the, the primary um, literary goal of the author was not to accurately depict like factual history. There was always an overarching goal, like literary goal, of usually providing like moral exemplar of either a positive or a negative hero or making like even more specific points. Like if you think, for example, that Plutarch like accurately depicts the life of Cato, the younger, you know, like dream on. This is not like I don't buy what it actually says about him. If you read it, he comes up autistic, but that's just because, uh, you know, that's how the, the literary... Um, goal of Plutarch in this specific biography comes across to us today. Uh, but yeah, I don't think like we have like a, an, an accurate characterization of those people from those uh, biographies. So I, I just want to make really clear what the logic and what the claim is. The claim is not that like one needs to hold a really high probability in these competing explanations. Yeah. It's merely that what is made problematic is the naive use of these things as evidence. When we have the presence of competing explanations that are plausible and adequately account for the data that's in question. Yeah. And that's what the issue is. And so when you're sort of in this rhetorical strategy of like saying, well, it must be the case and this is really really good evidence for that and then you're found to be you know competing against equally or oh, sorry equally explanatory explanations you're just being undercut in your um, claims and it doesn't need to be the case that we know it's the case that the author of the gospel of mark was doing this it's merely sufficient that this is a common thing that ancient literary authors did they employed rhetoric and uh, in socio-political conflict 
and uh, that it adequately accounts for the data in question. And that's really what my thesis is. Yeah, right, right. So it's like going back to, I, I just don't need to worry about the guy climbing up the sheer side of the building and sneaking into my flat when I remember that it's quite likely, given my rubbish memory, that I've just forgotten that I left my bag at my friend's house. I just, um, so that's the structure of that. So hopefully that analogy will be clear to everyone listening um, so that they can remember the structure of the, the argument that's basically that you're making in this point. So I think we've made this very clear. It's just gone 10. I'm happy to keep going for a little bit, but I feel like we're going to possibly need to do a round two to get through all of the content on here because, I mean... Th that would be great because I think it's really worth talking a little bit about the prior probability. Because mm -hmm. you know we've basically the light motif was undercutting what is ultimately like the rhetorical strategy employed in this video, which is <laughs> to motivate the audience into thinking that the competing explanations are not explaining the evidence very well, yeah. and we are saying that you know it's plausible that they there it's reasonable to believe they are, uh, which then like kicks you back into evaluation of prior probability. So let, yeah, let's talk about how intrinsically probable it is that. Yahweh would raise Jesus from the dead. You know? <laughs> well, um, should we keep going in this, listening to Callum for a bit until he gets on to that point? Or... Well, he never does, actually. <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think we can. Oh, we I, can thought he, uh... I thought he does kind of start talking about, um, well, what if God wanted to raise Jesus from the dead? Oh, yeah, or whatever? That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, yeah, okay. Let's, let's go for another 15 minutes or so. Why not? Let's see. Well, let's see what happens. I mean, we could, we could run like another 20 seconds of footage from the video and talk about that for 15 minutes. But <laughs> let's just see what happens. Let's just improvise. I, you know, fuck it. The empty tomb is implied by other early resurrection creeds and sermons outside the Gospels, as in 1 Corinthians 15 and the second chapter of Acts. The narratives are simple with little to no embellishment, and they are devoid of theologizing or scriptural references. There's no hint of them being- Okay, sorry, I can't. <laughs> is that right? With, <laughs> is it? So a simple story, okay, I grant that, but little embellishment, he says that, Devoid of theological, uh, what does he say? Devoid of theological embellishment, but isn't it quite clear that there's theolo theological development through the, the gospels? I mean, you guys are much better able to explain that point than me, or maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe, maybe he's right. What do you think? Uh, no, I mean, I think that I really do find this claim incredible, um, and this is. I mean, what I really want to point out is that if you're an individual who has made some effort to read the, quote, other side of the fence, you should find these claims unlikely. Um, the the competing explanations that Cullum is dealing with from contemporary New Testament studies are precisely ones that uh, suggest embellishment, and they're precisely ones that suggest theological development or, you know, narrative constructed for theological presentation mm -hmm. or theological reasons. So it's just really like, to me, an example of somebody who's making no effort to present um, a accurate portrayal of what contemporary discussion looks like. And have you got a, to hand, possibly, um, an example of, of uh, what you would say um, fits that type of description of like theological development across the Gospels? Is there an easy, easy to describe yeah. example? Yeah, I would that? maybe quote, uh, like well, he's here is talking about specifically about the empty tomb narratives. So mm -hmm. I would just point to the role of the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John, where he's, uh, you know, in the Gospel of Luke, it's only Peter who goes to check the tomb finds linen cloth in the gospel of john we actually have this beloved disciple and the text uh, takes care to tell us that he was there first you know <laughs> uh, and you know there is more to say about like th the character of the beloved disciple in the gospel of john and what kind of role he might be playing in the narrative but yeah that's just like one example and there has been a lot and lot uh, right written recently um, about this kind of question yeah, and I mean, theological development, I want to be careful that I interpret that 
in a broad scope, not a narrow scope. So I'm not suggesting specifically within the empty, empty tomb narratives, there is a Christological development. But what I do think that there is, is a development in the traditions and how they're presented. So for example, what I was recounting earlier about the presence or absence of angels, the mm -hmm. you know mitigation strategy employed by the placement of the guards and uh, the guards at the tomb, um, the uh, the you know the angels or or not, and like Camille points out, the race between Peter and the beloved disciple, <laughs> and the multiple um, sort of. Uh, yeah, effectively to couch it just in terms of theological development, it, like Christological is not what I was intending. Yeah, right, right, right. But I mean, I think even on a reasonably broad understanding of uh, the presence of angels in, in later gospels that aren't there in earlier ones seems to be clearly theological development. Uh, it's not necessarily Christological, I suppose, but it does seem ramping up the kind of holiness, the kind of religious significance or something of the scene later. It's jazzing it up, right? It seems to me it's more exciting. Um, I don't know, I, but I'm not an expert as I, as I want everyone to be quite clear. I'm, not, I'm certainly no expert in this, but it's just how it strikes me as a kind of um, interested lay person. I mean, none of us have got any relevant qualifications. I want to stress that <laughs> over and <laughs> we're not professional historians, but obviously you guys know a crap load about this um, or else I wouldn't be uh, picking your brains about it. Um, okay, I'm gonna press play again unless um, you guys wanna say anything else. Cool. Made up to fulfill earlier scripture because the scripture isn't given in these early accounts of the empty tomb. There are even independent sources suggesting that the Jewish authorities themselves confirmed an empty tomb, both in Matthew's Gospel and in Justin Martyr's later work. There's no evidence that Jews were saying uh, that Jesus' body was still in the tomb, even though they would be in a position to check that. Moreover, the radical multiply attested cultural shift from resting on Saturday, the Sabbath, to Sunday, the Lord's Day, also counts as strong evidence in favour of their finding an empty tomb on the Sunday morning. Moreover, the burial tradition and proclamation of the resurrection strongly support the empty tomb story. And I have already argued that Christianity could not have arisen without an empty tomb, even before looking at Christian sources in particular. And so all this evidence leads the atheist historian Michael Grant to say, if we apply the same sort of criteria that we would apply to any other ancient literary sources, then the evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty. So I wanted to pause here. I don't know anything about Michael Grant. I assume you guys know a bit. He's, about he's a is. boomer. Uh, I, <laughs> I recently read his uh, history of Rome. Uh, it's like a pop uh, level. I mean, he's a, he's a good scholar. Like he, he's got a, um, interesting books about like ancient uh, historians and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, uh, he's was I think he was mostly active in seventies, and like a lot of the like. Um, I think it seems to me to be the case that the, the, a lot of the things that we were talking about, like for example, the consideration of literary conventions and stuff like that, that has only really been uh, like this kind of multidisciplinarity between literature theory and like ancient history and historiography has only really been the case uh, in the last, let's say 30 years. So maybe like he should consider. I don't know like how old this quote is and like, what his mm -hmm. current position is. I'm not sure if he's even still alive, probably not. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I can say that I uh, respect Michael Grant. I, one of the books that he wrote that um, was an influence on me is his book, um, uh, Information and Misinformation. Uh, it's like a study of ancient historians and the the ways in which um, their claims are wrong, the ways in which they fail, the ways in which their moral purposes override their historical purposes, and a very you know various things like this. Um, and, and he goes through like uh, Tacitus and Suetonius and uh, and a variety of uh, ancient historians. Um, but specifically, this quote. I think that 
if I was to reconstruct why he's saying this, um, I would suspect he is taking the Gospels to be um, a particular type of literature that is in contradiction to what I consider them to be. And, you know, maybe that's why we come to different conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, like, if you straightforwardly look at the Gospels and um, you know, use them as if they're a guide to reliable um, history, then, yeah, I think you would come to this judgment. I think the difficulty comes in um, when you notice that the subsequent Gospels to Mark um, repeat so much of the same information, but when you get into a very specific study of Mark itself, what you find is an author who shows um, this uh, narrative omniscience where he knows everything that there is to know including his character's thoughts he you know employs mm. literary devices extensively across the gospel he gives no explanation about how he's in the position to know the things that he claims um, etc and so it's in this way that I think that the gospel of Mark doesn't really sit as to be naively judged as equivalent to other ancient literary sources. Um, but yeah, it's a point of disagreement, I guess. I mean, I, to me, it's sort of just to be um, lowbrow about this. It, it, the function of this quote here at the end, which is kind of not really necessary. I mean, if he's like made his point, um, he's talked about the evidence that's backing it up. It's a bit like saying, um, here's a quote from my black friend saying that rioting isn't good actually and we shouldn't do it or something you know it's like it it doesn't matter that there's an atheist who agrees with you. like so what I don't know like are you just wheeling him out because he's a guy who agrees with you I'm I, rhetorically this kind of annoys me a bit like I don't know it I don't know, but, but, but then I was one, I, I've never heard of this guy, Michael Grant, before, so I don't well, know whether he's... Um, I do that yeah. all the time with conservative evangelical scholars, <laughs> if they agree with what I have to say. <laughs> so I, I'm not so, <laughs> I wouldn't be that judgmental. But yeah, I mean, th that's uh, like an obvious rhetorical strategy, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess maybe it's, maybe it's just, I'll forgive him, but it's a, it's a rhetorical strategy and it, it's a debate. So yeah, why not employ a rhetorical <laughs> strategy if you like? That's the um, the genre that we're in, uh, analyzing here. <laughs> yes, so we should be fair to that. All right, I'm going to give us a couple more minutes to see what happens. For the appearances, I have already argued that the rise of Christianity, known from non-Christian sources alone, makes it overwhelmingly probable that Jesus' followers and others had robust public experiences of what they took to be Jesus. But we also have specific detailed evidence that they had such appearances. Jesus' followers and others had multiple experiences of Jesus, according to many accounts throughout different Gospels, the Book of Acts and New Testament epistles. These included appearances not only to Jesus' followers, but to those who thought he was crazy or a false prophet during his ministry, like his brother James or his mother Mary. Okay, and this is another thing that, um, which is whilst you guys are, are here, um, sometimes I hear this, the idea of uh, James, the brother of Jesus, being like super antagonistic towards Jesus in his life. Um, and I don't know, I genuinely don't know how, how much he features in say the gospels or whatever, like where does that come from? Is there good reason to think, or is it kind of a convenient villain? Because you know, the, you know, sometimes they say the same thing about Paul, like he was super persecuted the, the Christians so much. And then that means it's even more impressive when he changed his mind later. Is that really right that he thought Jesus was mad and he was, dead set against him or, or is it a passing couple of comments or something? How do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I mean, so from my understanding, the evidence for this claim about James derives solely from, at least within our earliest literature, solely from uh, the Gospel of Mark and subsequently repeated in later Gospels. And, or actually, maybe not even repeated. Maybe you can correct me on that, Camille. Um, uh, actually, so actually, this is very important, right? So the claim here is that James started as thinking that Jesus was crazy, and then he ended up as one of the prominent uh, like early church authorities, right? But the problem is that this is a composite of two different sources that each only contain 
one of the two pieces. So in the Gospel of Mark, you have this claim that Jesus' family thought that he was crazy, and his, it lists his brothers, including James. And then in the Gospel of Mark and in, uh, in the Gospel of Luke and in Acts, you do find James being uh, and Jesus' family being mentioned as like one of the uh, people who are active in the early church. But what's very significant is that both Gospel of Luke and Gospel of Matthew actually drop the line from the Gospel of Mark, where mm -hmm. he says that Jesus' family thought that he was crazy. So if we only had the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, we wouldn't know ever, like we wouldn't have any information from any source about Jesus' family originally thinking that he was crazy. And I think this is very significant. And I think the reason why the omission was made is because these are the two Gospels, which also include an infancy narrative. So they actually say something about Jesus' birth and childhood. Yeah, right, right, right. So it's like you would want to drop the line about Jesus' own family thinking he's crazy if you are also telling a story about how angels appeared to his like mother and father and there were all kinds of things going on when he was 12 years old, right? It like, no longer makes sense for his own family to think that he's not a messiah or a son of god you know yeah, I've never uh, thought yeah about that like before. this this idea that he's you know teaching in a way that everybody finds so impressive in a temple uh at a young age of you know 12 or something like that and yet and his parents acknowledge this and are told this yet somehow think he's crazy and i think this goes back to you know like well then what explains the contents of the gospel of mark that's being used as a you know as an inference about james and you know once again you get into the situation where it's not clear that uh the this idea that james did think that jesus was crazy is uniquely explained uh by the you know him actually thinking that he was crazy mm -hmm. what maybe one minor point uh there also isn't it's never said anywhere why james converted granted that he did right it's it's not like it says somewhere oh james uh, became a christian or started believing because jesus appeared to him he's mentioned as one of the people assuming this is him in first corinthians 15 because there are multiple people named james in early mm -hmm. christianity uh, as one of the people who saw like jesus appearing to him but like for all we know he was already a christian at that point right so you need to like even make that additional um inference or like even that additional assumption that this is what uh convinced him and not for example early christians coming to him and like presenting an exegesis of jesus from the old testament or something well, like that we already know that no jew would come to that belief unless they'd had strong tactile polymodal experiences of a robust nature so it must be given that strong solid evidence that um they could have only converted in those circumstances okay um i think i need to go to bed <laughs> um and other, there's no stopping point. There's not really going to be anything in particular where, we, where we'll come to. So I'm just going to say now that we'll stop and we'll pick this up again. We're at 52.49 through this video and we'll pick it up. I guess there's another at least 10 minutes, I think, of, of him talking. So we'll probably fill at least another hour, probably more, though, because we're going to get into some, I think, more philosophical things um, that come up later on. So thank you both for coming in spending the time to explain stuff that you know way more about than I do. Um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll do this again soon. Oh, thanks Thank for you. having me. All good. Okay, so I'm going to stop.